ओके गुड आफ्टरनून दी करेंट इश्यूज एंड एनवायरमेंट practically we can divide these issues or majority of these issues they can be divided with biodiversity with uh, pollution climate change conferences policies and the miscellaneous types or the alternative things which have been which can be seen in environment practically we can divide this thing or the content that we have for this into two parts the first part we will discuss about biodiversity pollution and climate change the second class that is tomorrow we'll discuss about uh, issues related to uh, conferences various organizations the international organizations into news this time also we can take up uh, issues associated to the national policies which have been taken up right so three today three tomorrow and the miscellaneous issues in the mid that can be seen respectively the first aspect of it or the issues which we majorly see with biodiversity you have the content for this right so see three things are important for this number one we have to go through with content you have to go through with content so with the class we would go through with the important aspects of the content as well second thing the idea where this particular issue if it if this this particular issue is been raised there are numerous things in current affairs the priority ones we take and then when priority ones we take then out of this particular issue what all can originate that can also be important right so looking on to what type of the questions that we can trace out of a particular issue that can be raised or that is been raised that can be important the first aspect of the first issue in biodiversity is with nilgiri tar one goat antelope species which has been seen in specifically in the nilgiris is a species which is endemic endemic to kerala karnataka and tamil nadu the species which majorly finds its habitat in the shola grasslands shola grasslands in nilgiris are the intermittent patches of grasslands we have forest ranges then we have grasslands then forest ranges then grasslands then forest ranges in this way shola and the forest right or the shola forest and the grasslands these are intermittent patches of the grasslands and nilgiri tar is one of these species which majorly harbors this particular area earlier nilgiri tar was was abundantly present in the areas of nilgiri now turned into nilgiri biosphere reserve which comprises of two major wildlife sanctuaries five major national parks with the boundaries nilgiri biosphere reserve has been one of the major home for nilgiri tar and abundance of it has been seen currently much of this species is protected in eraviculum that can be important the eraviculum national park which is one of the segment of the nilgiri biosphere reserve also now 
if we look up to the present aspect of it, there are threats which are being posed over, uh, over Nilgiri tar and that is why this particular species has now turned into an endangered species. The major threats that has been spoken of are the threats which are associated with hunting and poaching. loss of habitat then pollution has also added on to degradation of the habitat which have been taken up as one of the major problems associated. Apart from this, much recently there has always there has also been an impact over the Shola grasslands. The Shola grasslands they have faced much amount of the impact because of the exotic species being introduced competition amongst species, endemic species will face problems. Also practices in agriculture specifically livestock rearing has also been responsible for the decrease in the overall population of the Nilgiri tar currently. Right, that is why this particular species has been into news. Now things that we can link up over here, first aspect the Nilgiri biosphere reserve, major vegetation that we can see over here, is deciduous and montane specifically the south western guard deciduous patches that extend from the western guards towards Nilgiris, those patches plus the Deccan, the southern Deccan extensions of deciduous and the montane of the Nilgiris and the western ghats also. So, first variety of the question that can be framed over here, write down a question over here. Consider a species, consider following animals. which are one of the major which are one of the major endemic species of India and exist in vegetations extended from moist and dry deciduous and montane ranges, moist and dry deciduous and montane ranges which of the following which of the following can be seen in these patches number 1 nilgiri tar second nilgiri langurs third lion tail macaque
fourth bonnet macaque bonnet b o double n e t bonnet macaque the correct choices which of the above is correct only one one and two one two and three all of the above now see extension to this if we look up to then there are two more species that we'll also see over here two species of langurs which we can see over here one species of macaque which is also there in kerala karnataka tamil nadu over here that is lion tailed macaque one more population of the macaques which is over here which is the nilgiri langur and the population of the nilgiri tar we can find over here so adjacent populations can be seen in these regions though all of them that is the lion tail macaque is also endemic the nilgiri langur is also endemic the nilgiri tar is also endemic to this particular region but majority of the lion tail macaques they would be found in the moist and dry deciduous patches ranging of it in the montane or the distribution of it majority in the montane may not be seen so is with nilgiri langur also right so it could be a confusing party or, or a part where patches of kerala karnataka and tamil nadu three species distributed in all these but then too we have to look up to moist and dry deciduous as well as montane both so these species which are majorly inhabiting the sholas they would be the endemic species over here so the much probable answer would be nilgiri tar into this right the much probable answer would be nilgiri tar for this that can be one aspect of the question that can be asked second related to the species apart from this the lion tail macaque and nilgiri langur we have discussed also with this that can be one question the basic extension of the nilgiri biosphere reserve that you might have gone through with the basics also the extent of that biosphere reserve can be important or the geography of this biosphere reserve can be important these could be three or four dimensions of the questions that can be asked right present status of nilgiri tar remains endangered also the problems associated with sholas right now that is with the exotic species next पहला तो इशू ही बहुत दिक्कत है प्रनाउंस कैसे करोगे राइट देर आर थ्री डिफरेंट प्रनाउंसिएशन द बेस्ट वन द रेजॉक्सकीज हॉर्सेज राइट रेजॉक्सकीज हॉर्सेज दीज हॉर्सेज दे हैव बीन थॉट टू बी द ब्रीड ऑफ एशियाटिक और द मंगोलियन हॉर्सेज also termed as the asiatic wild horse a species of the horse which is a mid height species or mid length species 
red or brownish in appearance and has been thought to be the remnant of the wild horses in the world. But this particular species through identifications now have been identified to be a species which is the which has a close connection between the wild and the domestic horses or the domesticated horses. Or they are thought to be the earlier generations of the domesticated horses which have been seen. They have a linkage or they were earlier domesticated then gone into wild. So, they are now the wild horses. They are not the exact descendant of the actual wild horses or we can see or we can say that the wild horses population is or the actual population of the old world wild horses is now extinct. It was thought that this was earlier this is the wild horse population which is present in the world, but now it is being tra uh, traced that it was a domesticated horse which then went into the wild and became the Asiatic wild horse. So, it is the initial population of the domesticated horses not the wild horses. So, we say what species are now extinct of those species wild horses are also extinct from the world or the old world wild horses are also extinct from the world. The type of question that can arise out of it or what we can trace out of it that we can write. Consider following species, consider following species of animals and define which of them are now extinct in world are now extinct in world number 1 mammoth mammoth cheetah wild horses lesser rhinoceros, wild horses, lesser rhinoceros. Which of the above are correct? One, two and three only, one and three only. 1, 3 and 4 only all of the above. One and three only because cheetah is not extinct from the world. Cheetah may be extinct from India, is not there in India, but not but the population is there in Iran also, the population is there in Africa also. But the population of cheetah is not seen in India that would be reintroduced also. Mammoths they are the old world relatives of the elephants that we see. The lesser rhinoceros is also one of the population of rhinoceros which is present in Java. Only rare of these are being present now in Java near to 58 to 61 species or number of them are present which is the closest relative of the rhinoceros which is seen in India the greater one horned rhino and the lesser one horned rhino these are two different populations which are seen one in Java one in India. So, they are not extinct the lesser rhinoceros is also not extinct although it was earlier thought that one of the population which was the Bornean rhino or the Sumatran rhino certain populations of that has now been extinct though the population of rhinoceros is now seen in Sumatra also in Java also in that area, but these there are certain subspecies which may have been extinct the traces of which are not being known just a hypothesis is created that there are certain more relatives of the rhinoceros which is present in Java and Sumatra they might have been extinct, but rhinoceros they are present in India, Java, Sumatra and Africa 
in the parts of Central Africa and in the parts of Southern Africa also, the rhinoceros is present, right. So, if we look up to this particular question, extinction can be one aspect that can be raised out of this particular issue, otherwise it would be a simple plain issue that, that, that can be raised over here. Apart from this, from horses if we link, one more thing that can be linked is to donkeys. So, if we extend it to that, that level also, the issues of the Indian wild has can be seen or Khur, the one which is present in the great run of Kutch, as the population of the wild ass which is present, which is currently threatened because of the loss of habitat, habitats, is one of the species which is conserved fully also under Wildlife Conservation and Protection Act. That can be, that can also be traced. The relative of it, Kiang, though we have discussed earlier also, the one which is the Tibetan wild ass or the Tibetan ass, these are related species or we can say horses and donkeys if we relate. Then these are two major species, the Tibetan one, currently though not threatened but is under over exploitation so we relate things out of this issue also these two things or two three things they we can trace it out one is these horses they were thought to be the wild horses but are the domesticated horses which has gone down into wild and now the wild horses population may be extinct or the old world wild horses are extinct related things are with Indian wild ass and the Tibetan ass. The third issue that we can look up to is the issue associated with rhinoceros, rhinos in India, three issues have been discussed with this, the rhino day on September 22 and then the increase in population of rhino in Kaziranga and the basic, ex basic distribution of rhinos in India. Rhinoceros if we speak of, globally there are five major populations as we have discussed right now. The first one is the white rhino, second one black rhino, third one Indian rhino, fourth Javan rhino, fifth Sumatran rhino. The white and the black rhinos are the subspecies which are there with Africa. The Indian rhinos or the great one horned rhinos. The Javan rhino, rhinos, the lesser one horned rhinos, the Sumatran rhinos, rhinos, which are the smallest in size if we look up to, are the five major populations remain distributed in Africa, India, earlier they were distributed all across. If we look up to then starting from this Pakistan to the, uh, the foothills of Himalayas, then down towards the Terais in Uttar Pradesh, then extended from here to Nepal, also extended from here some, some wandering population over there in China, all of it into the northeastern part of the India and then the southeastern part of the indo malay plate also we had rhinos and the rhino population which is the population which might have 
or the closest population originated distinctively from the African population also. So if we link up to the Indian diversity and the African diversity, this also can be one of the link where the similar type of apart from the carnivores or the cats or the tigers and panthers and all the family that we speak of, this can also be one of the link between African and Indian diversity. Now presently the great one horned rhino which is present in India specifically remains distributed in four major states, major population in Assam, second population in West Bengal, third population in Uttar Pradesh and the fourth population also in Northern Bihar. Wandering populations we can also see in southern Nepal. And in reintroduced population we can see just two of them. We can see in Pakistan also. Then there are reintroduced populations in US also in Ohio, earlier it was kept in, it was the captivated reintroduced population. These are reintroduced population, but the natural occurrence of if we see Assam, West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, majorly the distributed areas or the major conserved area is Kaziranga National Park of Assam. Apart from this, remains extended up to Dudhwa in Uttar Pradesh, Katarni Ghat also in Uttar Pradesh. These are certain areas where the distribution of it can be seen apart from other national parks or seven national parks have been marked into this. Of this, the major population remains with Kaziranga only, right. Some of the population is also seen with Manas in Assam, also in Pavitra wildlife centuries of West Bengal, the populations of it can be seen or populations of rhino can be seen constantly. Rhinoceros if we speak of, the Indian rhinoceros is population which is a leaf eating population. These are leaf eaters specifically and they prefer to live in the grasslands of the Tarai. Is the second large animal or the terrestrial animal which is seen in India apart from the elephants, right. To protect the rhinos in 2005, rhino vision or the Indian rhino vision 2020 program was started which is targeted to double the population or to reach up to a population of 3000 rhinos by 2020 started in India which is also one of the major conservation program currently for rhinoceros. September 22 is celebrated as the rhinoceros day also and majority of the conservation initiatives have been taken up recently. The status uplifted to vulnerable currently for the Indian rhinoceros. So the extent of it, where it can be seen, distribution of it and then the geography of Kaziranga, though the geography of Kaziranga is listed, two major things extends over there with two major rivers which is one is Brahmaputra which flows through the northern part of Kaziranga and the other ones are the Diplu and Moira uh, basins which are there in the southern part of the Kaziranga. These are two major rivers with Kaziranga, Brahmaputra
So, majority of it remains distributed in this patch or the Tarai patch. That is why it is important. The one horned rhinos, they are the Indian and the Javan only. The black and the white rhinos, they are not one horned rhinos, rather, they will have two horns. The Sumatran hornos, they will also, they are smaller and they do not have either uh, uh, certain subpopulations do not have horns or they have populations with smaller horns, two horns, right. So, the one horned rhinos, now the type of things that can, that we can trace out or confusing things that we can trace out of it. Number one, the one horned rhinos are only found in India, right, that is not correct. The one horned rhinos can also be seen in Java, that can be one thing. The second misconception that we can have, because rhino to hum sab ne padha hai aur rhino lagta hai chalo thik hai ye to ban jayega, okay. The second thing, the distribution of rhino, right. Distribution of rhino not only in Assam and West Bengal, but also extends up to Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, right. Agar thoda sa bhi doubt hoga ya confusion hoga, to humko lagega Assam se Arunachal Pradesh mein chala jayega, right. Lekin Uttar Pradesh jana thoda sa muskil hai, utna dur kaha jayega rhino, right. So, that can be one confusion that can arise over here, right, okay. So, if the distributive states they are being given, rhinoceros in India is found in which of the following states and Assam, West Bengal, Arunachal or fir related de diya, Tripura de diya or saath mein Uttar Pradesh de diya, to ho sakta hai ki hum answer mein Arunachal or Tripura correct kar ke a jayen aur Uttar Pradesh ko chhod de, right. So, that confusion must not arise, that must be clear that the distribution is in these states, major conservation point Kaziranga. Right. Now, there is, a, there is a slight confusion with the conservation point also, Kaziranga and Manas also. Right. We, we find that, okay, rhinoceros is there in Manas also, rhinoceros is there in Kaziranga also. Right. So, if both of them are given, the major conservation of rhinoceros is seen in Kaziranga, Manas and then one more is given, Jim Corbett. Right. One and two, the major conservation of the major population is in Kaziranga and Kaziranga was established for conservation of rhinos. Manas was established for conservation of uh, uh, elephants and then being a tiger reserve also, right. And host the population of rhinoceros as well over here, right. So, these two, three confusions at least because this is a, this is a topic which is a, which is an easier topic. We go for tiger, we go for elephant, we go for rhinos. These are certain species that we know. So, that must remain. Neither we cannot say that this particular population right now or the greater one horned rhino, the distribution of it has become endemic. It is endemic to Indian states because greater one horned rhino population or wandering population, we can find it in Nepal apart from India. But near endemic population for the greater one horned rhino is seen in India, that can also be thing. It is not native because distribution of these type of the rhinos, it is thought to have came from the Sumatran side from Sumatra up towards China, right, that has been the distribution. So, you would not say this is the native population, but yes, a population which is near endemic to Indian subcontinent right now, right. These terms, they can be also important in making questions, okay. Chalo. Next thing is one of the issue associated with the Humboldt penguin, a penguin which was seen in the Baikula Zoo and the, the, the baby has died because of uh, post uh, its birth only. That is why that has been into news, the penguin. Penguins basically we look up to, then the Humboldt penguins, they are a, a subspecies which is seen and uh, it is more vulnerable currently. Penguins majorly remain distributed or the basic habitat of penguin is the northern pole or the southern pole, southern pole always, right. So, just a small fact on that. Next thing is associated with the dolphins. Dolphins in Indian subcontinent or near Indian subcontinent?
near Indian subcontinent, if we speak of the riverine dolphin, then we can find two major populations. One is there in Indus, which is termed to be the Indus river dolphin. which is seen in Punjab of India and is major species seen in the rivers of Pakistan. In India, 185 kilometer stretch of Bayas river will have this Indus river dolphin. The second one, both of them, they are related subspecies the Gangetic river dolphin. The Gangetic river dolphin that remains distributed in Ganga, Brahmaputra, Meghna. So, is a population which is seen with India as well as with Bangladesh. light patches of it. So, majorly these two type of the dolphins or these two species of the dolphins if we look up to, then they are practically blind, they have a longer snout, they have an ability to, uh, to go for eco locations use sound waves for their movement and navigation are the major characteristics of this is the aquatic national aquatic animal in India. Also is the city animal of Guwahati. are certain facts of it. The issue has arised because of the threats which are being posed right now. Right. Apart from this, we can also find one more population that is the Iravadi dolphin, the related party to this. Iravadi dolphin is not blind, does not bear a snout and is not riverine. It remains in the deltic, delta and saline or the marine conditions. Iravadi dolphin which is also seen on towards the eastern part or the eastern coast of India which is also seen with Orissa. Iravadi dolphin or the Gangetic river dolphin or the, or the Indus dolphin, all these three, they are currently endangered. Threats that are being posed currently on Gangetic river dolphin is because of dams, increasing siltation, also because of barrages and which segregate the population, industrial pollution, one more thing that can be seen with these is these dams and barrages, they are isolating the genetic uh, uh, species or they are, they are creating a genetic barrier amongst the population. Because now these species are linked specifically or they remain 
distributed in smaller area rather than the complete stretches of the river. Those which are trapped with the dams, they are there in smaller areas and genetic stagnance can be seen over the year with these populations. That can also be one problem that can appear with the Gangetic dolphins. The Iravadi dolphins, they are otherwise they are also under threat because of uh, uh, constantly increasing marine pollution, also because of hunting. The Iravadi dolphin has been under threats in the delta region. The, uh, the siltation is also creating problems with the Iravadi dolphin, right. So these three of them, the local names, Bhulan is given a name to this, Indus, this is the Sisu or Susu name given to this Gangetic dolphin and Iravadi is the name given to the Iravadi dolphin itself, right, the local name also. So these are three major species. Conservation currently of the Gangetic river dolphin that we can define is with the Vikramshila dolphin century that is in Bhagalpur district of Bihar conserves dolphins in a stretch starting from Sultan Ganj and post that. So majorly conserved right now though the population is now protected and initiatives are being taken up. Clean up of the river Ganga would also help in improving the population. Otherwise, the populations are facing constant threats currently. So the questions, although it has been asked quite a number of times, at least once or twice it has been asked with UPSC. The questions, first thing, whether it is endemic only to Indian mainland, not endemic to Indian mainland, it is shared with Bangladesh also, related species shared with Pakistan also, though not the Gangetic river dolphin shared with Pakistan, if it is said that Gangetic river dolphin then only India and Bangladesh, right. Dolphins in the Indian subcontinent they can be seen with India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, right, dolphins on a whole, right. Apart from this, the status, all three of them they are endangered currently, being blind, not being blind, being the, the major threats which are being seen over here, threats over here, similar threats are here also, right. The Indus dolphin in Pakistan is taken up as the indicator of the uh, indicator of the riverine health. If the river health is decreasing that or the in, uh, river, uh, Indus river dolphin population is decreasing, then the riverine pollution is also increasing. In the same way we can look up, we can compare it to the Gangetic dolphin also. If the river health is decreasing, then the population would also decrease constantly. Apart from this, there could be other factors apart from pollution. But pollution indicator species can also be seen or one of the partially indicator species of pollution can be seen with dolphins or the riverine health can be seen with dolphins. That can also be one stretch that, can, that we can trace out of this issue. Next thing or Another issue or the next issue is with the turtles, specifically the olive ridley turtles. Now olive ridley turtle is also one of the important species which has been asked in UPSC papers earlier also. Now we can stretch out certain more things out of this. Turtles if we look up to or sea turtles if you look up to, there are seven varieties of sea turtles which are seen of which five are prominent. One is the olive ridley turtles, then we have the loggers head turtle, then we have the leather back turtle, we also have the hawksbill turtle,
and the green sea turtles. These are five major varieties of the turtles which are seen of all these turtles that we look up to except the loggers head turtle, olive ridley turtles, leather back turtles, oxbill turtles and the green sea turtles all of them have nesting sites in Indian coastlines. of which the major population which is seen is olive ridley turtle. Half of the global population of olive ridley turtle is seen in India and 90 percent of that population is seen in the, the coastline of Orissa. In Orissa the major sites that have been marked first one is with Gahirmatha. Second one, Rushi Kulya. Third one, Astranga. Fourth one, Devi River. Fifth one is also now marked as the Bahuda Rukri or the Bahuda River fronts. They are also being taken up now as the nesting site the issue has been because of this because this nesting site has been taken up now in Odisha. Apart from this in Andhra the Koringa also act as the major site where the, uh, the olive diddly turtles can be seen. So, 90 percent of the nesting sites are now with Odisha. In Andhra, we have Koringa, as one of the nesting, major nesting site. Currently, other things that we can see is related to threats, which can be, which, which we see as imposed threats. The major threat, loss of habitat. capturing these olive ridley turtles for food also in the local uh, population. So, hunting also though of the major varieties of the turtles there are 10 species of the turtles which are being restricted for not being kept as for not being kept as pet also or not being kept into captivity of which olive ridley turtle is also one variety that it cannot be kept as a pet or in captivity under wildlife conservation. But the major problem right now with this is with climate change as well. Climate change is one of the major problem with the olive ridley turtles. The major problem with climate change is that the increasing temperature is now forcing induction of the female characters in the eggs of the olive ridley turtles. So, the number of females they are increasing with the olive ridley turtles or the next generation higher number of females or the number of males where they may decrease. So, this gender ratio amongst turtles would then lead towards a particular problem with the consistency of the population over here or the consistency of the olive ridley population over here that can be seen as one thing over here right. So, the issues that can arise out of it the major the major areas of distribution first thing second one the type of the turtles that we can see there are five major one the although the leather bag do not nest in India rest of them they nest in India. So, one thing which of the following write down a question also which of the following turtles are found nesting in India? Which of the following sea turtles are found nesting in Indian coast?
number 1 logger said second olive ridley logger's head second olive ridley third green sea turtle fourth leather back which of the above is correct only two two and three two three four all of them two three four can be then the distribution of or the nesting sites of it can also be raised as questions over here then the major carnivores of the country tigers issues associated with tigers issues associated with cheetah issues associated with lion and issues associated with leopard specifically the melanistic leopard right of this the issues associated with tigers first thing is the global tiger recovery program is started the global tiger tiger recovery program is one of the major initiative which was taken in 2010 by 13 major tiger countries or the or the tiger inhabiting countries so the first aspect of it the 13 major tiger countries right generally we go for the facts related with tiger tiger is only seen in india or tiger is only seen associated with the indian subcontinent or tiger is seen in which of the following countries can be one aspect of the question tiger is seen in 13 major countries majority of these countries they can be seen as Bangladesh, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Indonesia, Myanmar, Malaysia, China, Cambodia. These are eight. Then we have Nepal, Thailand, Vietnam. Russia and Laos these are 13 major countries where tigers can be seen B square I square M and C and then we have NTRVL these are 13 countries where the tiger population can be seen Bhutan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, India, Malaysia, Myanmar, China, Cambodia, Nepal, Thailand, Vietnam, Russia and Laos. The maximum population of these 13 countries, the major population of it is seen in India. In India it has been reported as 2226 tigers currently by the NTCA that is National Tiger Conservation Authority. Next thing that can be important, so largest to India, my second largest. Bangladesh mein. Second largest in Russia. Third largest population in Indonesia. then Malaysia, then Nepal. These are five major states of tiger population. Largest population is 2226. The second largest population in the globe is 433. There is a difference of existence of tigers currently. Apart from this, conservation of tigers that we can speak of started by National Tiger Conservation Authority, NTCA, which is established in 
2005 under the wildlife conservation and protection act amendments of 2006 under the wildlife conservation and protection act section 30 of the five major conservation steps that can be taken or the five major conservation reserves that can be taken are national parks wildlife sanctuaries conservation reserves conservation reserves can act as the adjoining areas between two major conservation points they can be zones of connection between two conservation point if we have one national park or wildlife sanctuary another one over here the areas which are conserved in between they can be conservation reserves community reserves and tiger reserves these are five things that can be established through an initiative under wildlife conservation and protection act the biosphere reserve initiatives are directly taken up by the national government these initiatives they can be taken up or initiatives that can be and that can be initiate uh, uh, can can be taken up by the state government also state government can pull up with these and then notified to central government and established right then apart from this if we look up to the tiger reserve currently the status of tiger reserve tiger reserve is given a complete conservation status just like the national park right tiger reserve will have two major zones one the core second one the buffer core zone is completely restricted zone and the buffer zone is the nearby peripheral zone of scare forest so just like the restrictions which are imposed over national park or imposed in national parks for human activity similar type of um, uh, restrictions are imposed with tiger reserves currently india host 50 major tiger reserves of which the bandipur was also in news because of the fire which has eroded in bandipur the bandipur tiger reserve was also in news currently because of the problems right these are certain things associated with tiger the major conservation initiative that has been taken up by ntca is tiger census apart from this captive reproduction of the tigers protecting the threats restrictions are imposed over hunting poaching electrolocation poisoning of the tiger under the wildlife conservation and protection act also tiger is being listed as the schedule one species which enjoys all the protection and the degree of the punishments if the tiger is been killed or hunted or poached the degree of the punishment are the, the most severe punishments which are been imposed schedule one species apart from this the wildlife conservation and protection act also permits killing up of tiger only in special cases by licensed authority only if the tiger is a direct threat or is a continuous threat to human life and property or second thing the tiger is diseased to an extent that it cannot be reverted back or it cannot be brought back into normal living or healthy patterns then only tiger can be killed apart from this killing up of tiger is not been is not permitted at all right is restricted under wildlife conservation and protection act ntca goes for the tiger census in every 4 years under the 13 tiger range countries the tiger recovery program is been started which is or which is targeted the global tiger recovery program is targeted directly for increase in population of the tigers in these countries or conserving the uh, tiger population in these countries majorly if we look up to the initiatives under the global tiger recovery program then st petersburg declaration has been signed between these countries right now this term can be important 
St. Peterburg's declaration. Though St. Peterburg declaration, if you google it down, you will find it for various other things. But St. Peterburg's declaration 2010 is for the recovery of the tigers. The recent St. Peterburg declaration you will not find. The, that declaration you will find in the early 19th century. Right? So the recent one is only for the uh, uh, conservation of the tigers between 13 tiger range countries. Right? So all these facts they can be important currently for tigers or conservation of tiger or issues related with tiger. Apart from this, tigers have, every tiger has specific strips. The strips in the tigers, they are the identification of the tigers. And one initiative that has been taken up for tiger census is M stripes initiative taken up by NTCA. N stripes is counting up of the tigers using the identifying lines of the tiger with the cameras which are placed in the wild. Currently it has been said by the NTCA that only 75 or 76 percent of the population is been, is been, is go, uh, would go under or is constantly going under census. Now with M stripes and other initiatives, next census of tiger would be for the 100 percent areas where the tiger can be present. That is in the northeastern states also the tiger census would be conducted, right. So now the northeastern states would also be brought under the tiger census. These are certain things which have been spoken of currently or which has been into news. The project tiger started in 1973, right, under the Wildlife Conservation and Protection Act. Then the tiger task force was created initially under the project tiger for conservation of the tigers then post 2005 under the initiatives taken up by the prime minister of the country ntca is created right national tiger conservation authority all these things okay so at least we must remember at least for this session we must remember four facts that can be important number one is the tiger range countries or the global tiger recovery program or the saint petersburg declaration is important Second thing, NTCA initiatives that have been taken, uh, NTCA uh, census initiatives every four year, NTCA conducts census, census is done by M stripes, pug mark counting, counting up of the individuals also by radio callers, these are traditional things. Then how the tiger reserves are created, though that is also constantly seen with the basics of biodiversity, tiger reserves are given a status of national parks and all, these things can be important issues associated with tiger, right. Next thing is cheetah. Cheetah, the population of, a, of, of the cats which are seen in India or which were seen in India and the last known cheetah was seen up to 1952 in the wild. Post that it was extinct in wild and completely extinct in India. Right. Now the reintroduction, reintroduction program is started by NTCA. And the reintroduction program of cheetah is to be started and three major sites were known or were marked for this, one in Madhya Pradesh, one in Rajasthan, two in Madhya Pradesh, one in Rajasthan. But now Nora Dehi wildlife century in Madhya Pradesh has been taken up as the site where cheetahs can be reintroduced and cheetahs can be reintroduced from Nigeria, sorry Namibia, that is introduction of African cheetah in India, right. Earlier we wanted the Asiatic cheetah to be brought down that is from Iran but the wildlife transfer programs were not feasible between India and Iran. So now we have this introduced in Nora Dehi, right. That is the second carnivore which is seen, right. Now with related to cheetah, the similar type of question that we have earlier seen that which of the following species are extinct in India. So at least go and find the Google down, right, the number of species which are extinct, the major ones which are extinct in India, 
cheetah is also extinct then there are certain related species of monkeys which are extinct right the old world monkeys which were seen so at least go and find the list of it and find at least five major of them right that are extinct in india that can be that can also be linked right the reintroduction programs have been seen in india this is the first reintroduction program which is seen in india right now right apart from this other species are other species which can be reintroduced they are to be there are many of them which are uh, under discussion but the exact initiative is not been taken up by government of india right the only initiative currently is with ntca that too by the initiatives taken up by the supreme court of india which wanted that reintroduction of the cheetah must be must be fostered because we were trying to reintroduce cheetah since 2006 right and sites were created but cheetah didn't came right and now supreme court said that you have the site now cheetah must come so NT ntca say that said that now cheetah would come right so that would start with 2019 the second the third thing associated to this is with lions the larger carnivores which are majorly seen in gir and related areas in gujarat of the population of the lions which we see in india majority of the population or the natural population of lions can be seen with gir apart from this the reintroduced population is also seen in rajasthan and in 2018 in nahargarh wildlife century lions were reintroduced or lions were introduced these are the nearby regions where lions can prevail one aspect of it the second aspect of it lions they have been suffering with a particular disease which is canine distemper disease canine distemper disease is a disease caused by virus canine distemper which is otherwise a parasite of herbivores herbivores majorly deers goats and antelope varieties now from herbivores it has gone into the the lions right and because of this it start create uh, it, it starts yellowing up of the teeth specifically and then the gums start to loosen up and they start to leave uh, lose their teeth right and a tiger or a lion without the teeth is of no use right it cannot eat it it would eventually die so eventually they started to die because of the infections or the canine distemper and this disease was reported in 2014 majorly in gir national park now they have got the vaccine that's why it was in news it was constantly was in news and now they have got the vaccine for canine distemper in the gir national park So two things associated with lions, one was the issues of Nahargal, the second issue is associated with the, uh, uh, with the canine distemper, was in news. And the fourth one of these carnivores is the melanistic leopard, which is seen. Melanistic leopard are the varieties of leopards only, leopards, the carnivores which are vulnerable in India the maximum population of these carnivores is seen in india it is expected that the uh, leopard population is in india is between 16000 to 18000 mature individuals leopards they have two major varieties now if we look up to leopards practically or their the skin characteristics leopards have blocks or which are termed as rosettes The rosettes of leopards, they are also characteristic because they have a patchy rosette. Black appearance over here and a lighter appearance in the, in the center. If we compare this rosette with the spots which are seen in cheetah, cheetah will have 
this completely as a defined pattern right defined spot but over here we have the rosettes these are two varieties the rosettes they appear over or the it is said that the yellowish fur appears over the blackish background right so there are two varieties of the leopards as far as their development is considered one is with the ro rosettes second one is the black the black leopard right so black leopard also exist in the wild along with the leopards in india and there are nine major states in which the black leopards can exist in india states where black leopard can exist the genetic dependence or the genetic studies also say that black leopards can be those which are seen as jaguars and panthers also right they can be close closely related species black leopards are found in india starting from kerala then we have it in tamil nadu karnataka goa maharashtra then from maharashtra we have it in chatisgarh we have it in orissa now the first population of it has been seen in orissa which is in sundargarh that's why it was in news then from orissa to assam and arunachal these could be nine states where the black leopards can be seen kerala karnataka kerala tamil nadu karnataka goa maharashtra from here we go down to chatisgarh to orissa then towards assam and arunachal this can be a movement also that they are moving from here along the western ghats then towards chatisgarh odisha assam arunachal right these are nine major states where the black leopards can be seen and it was seen for the first time in odisha and sundargarh that's why it was in news also the upper uh, the other carnivores as we all know is the snow leopard which remains distributed up from himachal pradesh down towards up to arunachal pradesh we can find into the upper stretches at an altitude of 3000 uh, meters above the sea level we can find the snow leopards the cats which do not have an ability to roar they cannot roar that's why they are important right their sighting has not uh, has decreased in the lower altitudes much recently right so that's why they were in news also the clouded leopards the leopards with which are smallest of them all they have a cloudy appearance as their body imprint that's why they are clouded which are majorly seen over here in arunachal pradesh up towards up to nepal we will find distribution of clouded leopards in india in arunachal we will find snow as well as clouded leopards both right that's why these varieties of the carnivores they have they have been in news for all these major issues that we can look up to then we have the issues associated with the on page number 17 of your booklet also the issue number 18 that is the harrier birds these are the migratory raptor species or the migratory bird species and india is one of the largest roasting sites or the sites in the world for harriers and specifically 
the hesar gatta in the outskirts of bengaluru has been into news also for these harrier birds right right now the convention on migratory species cms has was also in news because the next convention of cms is to be held in india so migratory species or certain migratory species they can be important migratory birds like harrier cranes saras crane these are some of the important varieties of the migratory birds which are seen in india convention on migratory species or the bon convention protects migratory species in their migratory habitats also that can also be related to this then issues related to elephants in india elephants a population of the large animals which is which is seen distributed all across the western ghats we'll have this there is a root of the existence of the elephants elephants can be seen over here western ghat areas maharashtra goa karnataka kerala Tamil Nadu does not goes into Andhra Pradesh. Now from here we can find it in Odisha, then West Bengal, Assam, down up towards migratory species towards Arunachal. No, though not much of the population. Then up from here, a movement is seen from here to Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. These are major regions where we will find the distribution of elephants. the population of the elephants which were earlier seen in andhra pradesh are now not seen because of excessive loss of the dense forest regions which are required for the existence of the uh, elephants in the country right project elephant is one of the conservation initiative which is been taken up for elephants now project gaj yatra is also been taken up by the wildlife trust of india project gaj yatra is directed towards decreasing the conflicts between elephants and humans human elephant conflict in the corridor areas has been the major major objective of the project gaj yatra so issues that can arise out of it the states in which the major population of the elephants that can be seen majorly kerala karnataka goa maharashtra tamil nadu odisha west bengal assam parts of bihar uttar pradesh we can find the populations of elephants up towards uttarakhand also we can find the populations of that is jim corbett and all raja ji we will find the uh, elephants being distributed right so the elephant states elephant movement the corridors where elephants can remain the major conservation points manas is there in assam is one of the major conservation point then elephants are also conserved down over here in the nilgiris and silent valleys also conservation is seen then in the uh, national parks in maharashtra also the conservation is seen in karnataka also majorly in kerala also conservation is seen all these remain the major conservation points of elephants also elephants if we look up to then two major population are seen in the world one is the african elephant and the asiatic elephant asiatic elephant is smaller also then we have the indian asiatic elephant also the indian variety because it remain distributed towards the southeastern part also uh, southeastern asia also the indian is smaller also in comparative to others right also the tusk is prominent in the in those which are seen in that region laos cambodia etc the tusk is lower or lesser in the indian वैसे भी tusk तो छोड़ा नहीं था जो tusk के जो poachers हैं उन्होंने tusk वैसे ज्यादा छोड़ा नहीं है but we if we have 
then the prominent tusk is seen in the southeast asian elephants also right that is one uh, uh, or these are two different populations asians and the african elephants which are seen right then the next issue or the issue number 22 that we can look up to that is related to andaman and nicobar islands which is home to the 10th of the india's fauna diversity or the animal species which are seen though we have a detailed discussion on andamans earlier as well but andaman and nicobar the major type of vegetation that we see in these is deciduous semi evergreen and the mangroves constantly with the circumference of it the forest increases right majorly we look up to andamans and nicobars the of of the semi evergreen the laurels they are important woods garjan anjan etc they are used as one of the important woods which originate out of semi evergreen and the deciduous patches the animals that we see they have the existence of the deer species deers sambar spotted also that can be seen over here we also have an introduced population of elephants to agar gaj yatra ko hum link karenge ya elephant se related question aa sakta hai to andaman and nicobar agar aa jaye to usme confuse nahi hona hai wo bhi ek correct hai right write down a question here which of the following areas have population of elephants existing which of the following areas have population of elephants existing number 1 uttar pradesh second assam third tamil nadu fourth andaman fifth chatisgarh all of them are correct for this right chatisgarh also the wandering populations from here to chatisgarh right this was earlier a patch from here to chatisgarh and then andhra the the south deccan plateau andhra and the forest over here this was a movement patch now it is not there here right but there is a movement right so the populations of the elephant right apart from this there are other major populations that we can have the salt water crocodile salty which is seen with the indian the eastern indian coast, uh, coast also up towards australia we will find this salty which is one of the largest crocodile of the major crocodile species that we see in india right not bitter kanaka but i am talking about the size of the crocodile right of the crocodiles that we see we have gadiyals we have magar and then we have the salt water crocodile also which is the largest of all right we have the mud crocodile the gadiyals and then the mud crocodile or magar and then the salt water crocodile or the salty which has been seen over here right so all these has been taken into consideration or the andamans and nicobar and their overall uh, vegetation has been seen much recently with the zoological survey of india and that's why it was into news 
then issue number 23 that we can look up to the adders tongue fern is one of the small fern which is also termed as the snake tongue fern it has been it has been seen in in patches of gujarat the western ghats of gujarat the extended regions of western ghats in gujarat that's why it, it was into it was into news and is important there is a variety of fern straight questions if they can if they can ask recently this term was into news what does it means right a straight question can be taken up over here then the vetiver grass has also been important vetiver grass is important or it was in news because of two major things number one a floating water treatment plant which has been developed in which vetiver act as one of the major plant species or one of the major species which can help in treatment of water second the grow uh, the farmers in tamil nadu they are growing whatever extensively they are growing ex whatever extensively because of three major reasons the first reason for whatever being grown is number one it it can help in uh, eradication of the pollutants from water number second it can be a crop protectant and pest repellent also that's why it is important it is also used for perfumeries also for the uh, chemical manufacturers the perfumes can be uh, extracted out of it or the aromatic substances can be extracted out of it that's why it has been into news and now since aromatic substances can be taken so pharmaceutical or related uh, therapeutic substances they can be extracted from vetiver that's why it was into new uh, that's why it has been grown also and also in conservation of the soil in soil conservation retenance of water creating a mulch out of vetiver is also important thing where the mulch covers the soil and the evaporative loss of the water can be reduced right also it helps to reduce the contaminants in soil so all these have been the important things where vetiver has find its importance and that's why it has been extensively grown in in the uh, in the areas of tamil nadu the things that can be important with this issue are the uses of vetiver grass that you can mark with your content as well what are the uses of vetiver grass then the issues associated with red sanders red sanders the related species of sandalwood has been constantly in news right the conservation category has been shifted for red sanders because it was constantly getting reduced so why it was in news the first thing into this issue number 25 more in news that you can that you can look up to after being classified as endangered in 1997 and added to red list this is the first time that the red sanders has been shifted to a better category right now they are being taken up as those which are not endangered rather vulnerables in these regions right that's why they have been in use red sanders if we look up to are those varieties which majorly grow in tandem with plantations of bamboo or bamboo forest which are majorly characteristic varieties of the dry deciduous and the mixed deciduous vegetations areas where red sanders are seen andhra pradesh parts of tamil nadu the deccan and the extended the the point where we have this we have the deccan over here then the western ghat we have the deccan over here then the southern deccan then we have the extended western ghats over here over here it starts from this patch if we look up to the dry and the mixed deciduous deciduous ranges and then on to these patches we'll find red sanders being grown right so it will have andhra pradesh tamil nadu parts of kerala and 
certain parts of Karnataka over here, where this vegetation can be seen, right. So though red senders has been into news, has constantly been into news, the basics of it, where it can be seen or why it is seen, it is a semi-parasite with bamboo. So it cannot grow isolated, it has to be grown with the nearby bamboo plantations, that's why and is a related species of sandalwood. Sandalwood now is also taken up as the religious grove plantations in Nilgiris. <coughs> religious groves are those where forest has been created for religious purposes and is managed and maintained for religious purposes for a long term utility, right. <coughs> So either the religious community protects the forest for the temple purpose or for other purposes if we look up to then. So sandalwood over there in Andhra Pradesh, uh, that region of uh, uh, the regions of Andhra Pradesh, it has been seen with religious grove also in Karnataka patches. Some of them have planted with sandalwood also the related subspecies red cinders. So it can be into news or it can be one of the important thing that can be discussed. Then there is one more news that is issue number 26. That is with the rosewoods, rosewood or if we look up to our, our status or a genus which is termed as Delbergia, it is one of these status which has been listed as or the complete genus has been listed as appendix 2 species of Citus. Citus Convention on International Trade for Endangered Species is one of the international or multi-party convention which has been created to stop the trade of endangered species. Citus list species in three appendices. Appendix 1 species are those where a, where a complete restriction is being imposed for its trade or its part. Appendix 2 species, Appendix 1 species are taken up on a global concern. Appendix 2 species are those which are not endangered or which are not threatened right now. But if there is a trade of these species, they can be threatened. Appendix 1 are threatened, they are not threatened. But if there is a trade at international level, there could be a threat which can be imposed. Appendix 3 species are those which are listed by any particular country for specific reasons, right. Delbergia or the complete genus of it, rosewood, etc., has been listed as Appendix 2 species. If you look up to number of species, near 800 species are there in rather near uh, 1400 species are there in appendix 1, near 14, uh, 12,000 species in appendix 2 and near uh, 600 species in appendix 3 are being listed currently, right. Delbergia has been listed, all the complete genus, all the varieties of Delbergia has been listed of which the rosewood is also seen. Now government of India has taken this rosewood out of this thing because the problems that, uh, that was faced with this rosewood was with the localites or the local handicraft was dependent on the rosewood and when they were selling it in the international market, the appendix 2 of Citus was restricting it to be sold in the international market. right? There is enough amount of rosewood which is present in the Indian wet, uh, mixed deciduous forest ranges in the southern India and the overall life cycle of Delvergia is, 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 is lesser. That means it requires lesser amount of the time to be regrown. So even if it is cut, it, it, the forest regrows within 1 or 1.5 years. So the life cycle is faster for the rosewood. So the problems may not be seen with the rosewood plantation in India. That's why it has been kept taken out of the appendix 2 list or has been requested to be taken out of the uh, appendix 2 list of Citus. Issues that can be important 
things related to situs, what is situs, how it lists these species, what is rosewood, rosewood is one plantation which is seen in the mixed deciduous ranges. Mixed deciduous, ever, uh, semi evergreens they will have the plantations of rosewood which is seen and major plantation of it is seen in the three major states of the western guards also right that's why it has been into news also rosewood has been news into news and that's why it was it has been discussed then issue number 27 is related to the kanchanjunga biosphere reserve which is now listed in the UNESCO's World Network of Biosphere Reserve. The UNESCO's World Network of Biosphere Reserve lists any particular important biosphere reserve where we have important practices of conservation on other important practices which are being taken up, right, which may be the traditional practices. Kanchanjunga Biosphere Reserve, the one which is there um, in between in the Sikkim, uh, specifically it, it, it has been surrounded by Nepal, West Bengal and the Tibet region, Kanchanjunga has been important because the natural or the traditional Buddhist uh, conservation practices have been taken up, where uh, conservation is dependent on a, a principle of care, we, we say, that a principle of care to nature or principle of care to everyone is being taken up, that is the Lapcha uh, practices which have been taken up in Kanchanjunga, that is why it was important also, right. So, a net, it is found in the network of world network of biosphere reserves, that is why it was important, the Kanchanjunga biosphere reserve. Then issue number 28, if we look up to the conservation of migratory birds and their habitats, the conservation of migratory birds and their habitats under Bonn Convention or CMS, the Convention for Migratory Species, which is, uh, uh, which is one of the initiative which has been taken up by the United Nations Environment Program also and the next conference for this CMS which was started in 2000 uh, which was started in 1983 is to be held in India and the mascot for this conference is the Great Indian Bustard that you can mark the Great Indian Bustard can be important Great Indian Bustard which is now critically endangered in India which was earlier seen in an, in an uh, in a larger population all across the Indian mainland just like the, the extent of Sambar we say in India, complete Indian mainland was the extent of great Indian bustard but has been killed excessively for, uh, for, um, for being a medallion, poaching also right and then there were threats, uh, pollution also was a particular threat with the great Indian bustard, now remains distributed in a patch extending from Rajasthan on to the central India part, some states of uh, northern India also up to Haryana we will find it and over here in Deccan, right, very less population of this great Indian bustard is seen and the conservation of it is to be, is to be driven because it is seen, it was seen all across, not only in Indian mainland, was there in Pakistan, Afghanistan up to, up to Afghanistan region we had that uh, great Indian bustard, just like we had the Shinkara distributed, in the same way Great Indian Bustard was also distributed, but excessive poaching has led towards this particular species being critically endangered currently, so this has been taken up, right. So two things over here, Convention for Migratory Species, right, started in 1983, the next convention is to be held in India and then the mascot for that would be the Great Indian Bustard, right. Then Issue number 29, then the Supreme Court has declared the areas around the national parks as the eco-sensitive, eco-sensitive zones are the zones around otherwise protected zones, eco-sensitive zones or eco-fragile zones are those zones which are kept as a buffer zone or 
a shock absorption zone for the protected areas of national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, tiger reserves, etc. These zones are created to reduce, not to restrict, but to reduce human activities. Specifically activities like mining or large infra development would then require proper authorizations or proper initiatives taken up by forest clearance. In the eco-sensitive zones, the traditional activities like agriculture by natives even earth movement for the local works etc. They are not restricted. But the higher level of the activities that is level 1, level 3 activities and post that they are restricted and they will require an initial forest clearance or the initial environmental clearance to be established. Right now with the directives an area up to 10 kilometers surrounding the conserved areas are to be brought down under the eco sensitive zones. Right. They would, they would not directly be a conservation zone, but a shock absorber for the otherwise conservation zones in the country. Then WWF has also inducted or indicated that India currently is facing a particular problem with its soil biodiversity and the major problems associated with soil biodiversity is with over exploitation of the soil resources depleting water resources and also accumulation of different types of the hazardous substances or pollutants with the soil. So the uh, number one is deterioration of the soil characteristics then that lead towards deterioration of the microflora associated with the soil. So that would lose the overall soil biodiversity right. This issue is there for current affairs but things can be asked in basics also right. A question that we can link up over here, which of the following factors are associated, which of the following factors are associated with degradation of the soil elements, soil elements. Number one, burning of crop residues, burning of crop residues, have an adverse impact, burning of crop residues have an adverse impact on factors on biological factors like birds second over exploitation of soil resources over exploitation of soil resources lead towards loss of soil microflora third excess utilization of chemical fertilizers excess utilization of chemical fertilizers 
pollutes soil and underground water resources pollutes soil and underground water resources fourth shifting cultivation increases the tendencies of shifting cultivation increases the tendency of acidification of soil resources which of the above is correct let me come with choices also then you think which of the above is correct only one two and three only two in three only one and three one three and four rather the choice would be the last choice would be two three and four Now look up to the immediate impact of what has been deteriorated in soil in this question, right? The immediate impact is number one, soil resources or burning of crop residues has a direct impact or immediate impact on the biological factors associated like birds. Birds are associated with soil with picking up of number one, picking up of the food, right? The amount of food which is available. The long term impact is if the fertilizers or pesticides goes down into water resources from there it goes into birds then start decreasing their population so there is a long term impact right the short term impact that is burning up of the crop residue burning up of the crop residue will have two impacts number one it will create oil layer over the soil resources second it will kill the microorganisms or the earthworms or the nematodes which are directly present right the implied impacts can be many but the direct impact is associated over the soil resources in two ways only right plus addition of the ashes increases acidification it there is a particular misconception also that the burning of crop residue adds on to the soil fertility because of increasing water retention because of addition of carbon substances in the soil but the amount of ashes which are associated with the residues of the soil the residues of the crop they are also associated with much amount of the acids so the acidification increases burning of the crop acidification can be direct impact loss of the nematodes or microflora or the microorganisms can be the secondary impact formation of an oil layer over the soil is the tertiary impact these three impacts so ideally over birds may not be the case second is correct third one is correct the fourth one shifting cultivation lead towards acidification how Ah, crops are burned then only shift okay forest is burned then acidification yes that can be a particular case right but shifting cultivation directly has loss of forest the first impact is loss of forest right and if the forest is lost then the basic organic substance adding factors of the soil they are also lost the biodiversity that can be added directly into the soil is also lost right so at least one does not stand correct for this two three and four can be the viable options for such questions right then question uh, issue number 31 if we look up to then the floods in kerala they have led towards one more problem that is introduction of certain types of the alien varieties of the fishes which were not earlier seen in kerala or in the overall extent of kerala uh, kerala's rivers that's why it has been into news now the problems that we can look up to the varieties will have problems or the problems of exotic species the basic problems of exotic species number one they can be pathogenic second they increase competition with 
endemic varieties it can disturb the biological equilibrium of any ecosystem it can also lead towards a species shoot species shoot means their population would randomly increase or unabruptly they would increase species shoot can also lead towards excessive consumption in an ecosystem which can lead towards ecosystem overshoot so the balance of the ecosystem can also be disturbed because of these exotic species since they are pathogenic so they can be <coughs> disease causing species also or they can also be parasitic in nature to these species which are present so decrease in population of the endemic varieties is seen all of these can be the direct or indirect impact of the exotic species or the alien species which are brought down right alien species is something which has came out of any particular area exotic can be fast traveling and fast dividing right and endemic are those which are there in that particular area only which are the invasive that has a tendency to invade any particular area like not all the species which are which we may say are exotic or alien are invasive in nature right if the factors that trigger then they come down to a particular area but majority other species they are invasive in nature they have a tendency to encroach any particular area okay, so species are um, man majorly triggered by the anthropogenic factors right <clears throat> so specifically if we look up to specifically 20 lakh invasive fishes they have came down to kerala and for this the name can be important the threat analysis the third point into that page number 25 in your booklet the alligator gar the goldfish the shark catfish or the malaysian wala the red bellied paku the four alien uh, invasive species namely east african catfish common carp tilapia and the sucker catfish majorly catfish and their varieties they have now came down to kerala which were not earlier seen and the major problem is these fishes can remain in polluted water also so what has happened with pollution of the water in that because of the flood and much amount of the sedimentation over there the water was polluted the back water was polluted so the natural or the native species they were not able to survive in that polluted condition but these were able to survive in the polluted condition so it would revert the complete ecosystem in the over a period of time that is one particular problem which has been seen currently with kerala or the biodiversity of kerala because it is one of the exclusive area also one of the major parts of one of the major uh, hot spots or biodiversity hot spots of india so the problems are seen in this next thing the bandipur tiger reserve that we have discussed the bandipur tiger reserve was in news because of an um, expulsion of the fire in that particular region right is uh, the bandipur is the extended region of the nilgiri biosphere reserve also is one of the part of the five uh, uh, national parks which are seen with nilgiri biosphere reserve bandipur which is there in the uh, chamar rajnagar of karnataka right important things that can be impo uh, that can be marked in this about the basic geography of bio, uh, bandipur and these three four have been into news one is bandipur second is kaziranga second third one is kanchanjunga fourth one is the nilgiri biosphere reserve then uh, uh, iravikulam national park with the nilgiri tar that was also important right manas was also into news these are certain uh, national parks these are these are those national parks which have been important or was in news then nora dehi if we look up to in madhya pradesh then related to nora dehi the amarkantak biosphere reserve can be important or the 
Kana National Park, which is there nearby Nora Dehi or the Panna uh, Wildlife Sanctuary, that can be important also in Madhya Pradesh. Right. Then you come down to Rajasthan. If we look up to the Nahargarh was in news, the new wildlife sanctuary. Then related to Nahargarh, Ranthambore can be important. Right. Then come down to uh, uh, lions in Gujarat, then Gir and the related area, run of Kutch, uh, that can be important. Right. So these are certain important uh, uh, areas which, can, which, which should also be seen related to this. Right. Then uh, this Bandipur National Park, the basic geography of it, at least go through with this. Then the Mammals of India. Mammals of India is a new initiative which has been taken up by the National Center for Biological Sciences, which is there in Bangalore, NCBS. It was in news because it has started a biodiversity start, uh, atlas project or a global biodiversity atlas project initially or biodiversity atlas India started with NCBS. Now under this biodiversity atlas India project NCBS is helping up or with is creating an online repository of the information related to biodiversity of the country and that information is input by the public participation also right where the tourist uh, informations the conservator information the informations which are being uh, which are being input by uh, environmentalist also those which are the amateur biodiversity uh, groups also they can help to put up the information related to any particular species in any particular area that helps to create a biodiversity atlas. Now, apart from the biodiversity atlas India, NCBS has also started with the mammals of India. This, is, this would act as a separate web repository regarding all the informations of the mammals which are found exclusively in India. So now NCBS will have two different projects. One is the biodiversity atlas going, another one is the mammals of India. Right. That is why it was in news also. So NCBS, National Center for Bio Biological Sciences, which helps in, which goes for researches related to biodiversity conservation and the extent of biodiversity. Present in Bangalore has two major projects. One is Biodiversity Atlas. Another one is the Mammals of India project, which is a web repository of the information related to biodiversity of the country. Right. Then we have this Mangal Jodi Ecotourism Trust. The Mangal Jodi Ecotourism Trust is there in Chilka area of Odisha and uh, it, it has been important because there was a change in the conservation of this particular uh, region because of an initiative taken up by the locals and that initiative can be a community initiative. Over here if we look up to the community initiatives that can be taken up for conservation of forest. The major community initiatives can be establishment of community reserves where the protected areas are established, managed and protected by with the help of the locals. That is an extended aspect of joint forest management, joint forest management is a social forestry initiative which is taken up under which there is an MOU between the local community and the forest department where the local community can gather the non-timber reserves of the forest whereas in the forest department gets the timber part of it plus 25 percent timber profits are being given to the local community also. In return, the locals protect the forest. They do not burn the forest also. Also reduce stress on forest ecosystem. That becomes the joint forest management initiatives. Apart from this, the village 
or the intermittent forest ranges under the conservation initiatives of biosphere reserve they also are managed with the communities as the major participator apart from this under the wildlife conservation and protection act also communities have been given importance where conservation or if we say conservation of any particular forest area is directed by community number 1 second any national park can be declared or it or its boundaries can be declared keeping communities into consideration where gram sabha becomes one of the major party right that's why community reserves are also important the any kind of the initiatives which are to be taken up for development in major conserved areas then gram sabha becomes the first party of the clearance where for conserved area if a particular project is to be initiated then first thing gram sabhas they have to be taken into consideration so in this way community initiatives or com, uh, or uh, community initiatives in forestation are important for improving the state of forest in the country and if we look up to the recent initiatives mangal jodi has taken up as one of the major important aspect over here because earlier the forest was there was a difficulty in the conservation now when this mangal jodi forest has, uh, or the trust is created the localites or the communities they have participated in taking uh, in taking care of the forest also that's why it has been into news the term the mangal jodi eco tourism trust name and why it was established if direct questions can be asked out of it then the sustainable catchment forest management scat form scat form is into news because it is an sustainable catchment forest management project which is undertaken with assistance of zika that is japan international cooperation agency right and the overall initiative has been taken up to reduce or to uh, address issues such as forest degradation loss of the forest specifically because of shifting cultivation right so scat form is there to reduce shifting cultivation in association with japan and to understand how shifting cultivation has a direct impact on forest degradation so term and its basic significance can be the directed questions that can be taken up next thing is a floating treatment wetland a floating treatment wetland is an initiative which is taken up in hyderabad right now facts that we can mark then then we'll understand it is a joint effort of ngo dhruvansh that you can mark and the hyderabad metropolitan development authority and it 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 is a cleaning up project right the basic clean up cleaning up of, uh, up of the water with the wetlands has been derived in this there are four layers of the treating technologies the first layer comprises a bamboo layer or the bamboo base then we have the foam over here or the styrofoam then we have an intermediate layer of soil like substances and then plants and <coughs> grasses are grown at the top majorly glass grasses like vetiver's etc tulsi also ashwagandha also they were grown over this this floating party 
so it has four layers one two <coughs> three and four major layers which are seen now using this these uh, strategies the structure remains floating over the water and it helps in treatment or it helps in removal of number one biologically available or biologically available nitrogens heavier metals and parts of organic substances they can be removed from the wetlands or the lakes that's why this floating treatment wetland has been important right important things can be the plants which are grown the cleaning agent planted on ftwr that you can mark whatever catalyst canna bulrush citronella citronella is also used for medicinal purposes then we have hibiscus the flowering herbs tulsi and ashwagandha right at least tulsi and ashwagandha that can be marked a simple question can be can also come up over here two options which of the following are correct for ashwagandha one it is a, a traditional herb second it is useful for therapeutic properties third it is also useful for treatment of water right so traditionally agar humne ashwagandha padha hai to ye do cheez to padha pata honge ki it is a, it is it is having a uh, therapeutic property it is herbaceous but useful for treatment of water that can be an added factor to this right so that can be important for this and the last the theme for the world's wetlands day this year has been the wetlands for disaster risk reduction therefore 2018 is taken up as the wetlands for sustainable urban future that fact can also be important related to wetlands right so these are issues associated with apart from this conservation of wetlands we have discussed earlier also the conservation of wetlands can be taken up with the ramasar convention which has the ramasar list of the wetlands apart from this the montrex record where the degradation which ha has been higher they are listed under the ramasar convention which was established in 1972 in india we have the national wetland conservation strategy also under which the national wetland authority is there and the state wetland conservation and management authorities are being placed the major uh, works are been now done by the state wetland conservation authorities and the national wetland authority act as the supervisory agency of all these states all these states they have to list the important wetlands in their uh, in their uh, areas these wetlands must be created or must be brought on a web repository also within 6 months of the guidelines that is by to, by the end of 2019 uh, there must be complete list of all the wetlands which are available in all these states that is also made mandatory these are certain initiatives which are taken up for conservation of wetlands apart from this the floating treatment can also be brought down it is an initiative though just uh, it has been brought down but if such tools they are been used they can be useful for plantation as well for treatment of the wetlands and conservation or restoration of the wetlands can be brought down and the traditional things associated with the threats which are posed over wetlands they can also be certain questions which can be asked related to this thing right next thing or the other issues they can be related with the issues in pollution and the first issue that has been spoken of that the quantitative assessment of nitrogen pollution has been done now nitrogen or as a pollutant if we look up to then oxides of nitrogen can be one particular problematic thing nitrous oxide 
is also a problematic thing. The oxides of nitrogen which are majorly created by incomplete combustion of fossil fuels majorly if we look up to these oxides of nitrogen they have three major varieties of the problems which can be created number one directly oxides of nitrogen have an impact on human population as the irritation of skin and eye the second pop, uh, problem can be associated with the plants where nitrogen or excess of nitrogen pollution can also lead towards necrosis of the plant parts it is also one of the candidate which causes acid rain and also one of the major candidate which is responsible for formation of photochemical smog the amount of nitrogen pollution or the emissions has been constantly increasing currently and it has been seen that uh, uh, this uh, this assessment has been done by the greenpeace international and it the assessment is done that uh, says that three patches in india they have very high amount of the nitrogen emission one is in delhi and cr second one is in the uh, region near the sonbadr which is between uttar pradesh and madhya pradesh sonbadr is also known for the coal mines and the power plants also and the talchar which is there in odisha right these are these are three major regions where the nitrogen emissions have been found higher the major problems or the major contributors to the nitrogen emissions right now in india have been taken up if you look up to box then the major contributors of nitrous oxide rather are agricultural soils where over 70% of it has been produced waste water 12% residual and commercial activities 6% nitrous oxide oxides of nitrogen they are from incomplete combustion of the fossil fuels currently the overall emission of oxides of nitrogen is constantly increasing this increase is because of increase in the automobiles also number one also the increase is there with the burning of the biomass though it has been constantly restricted in the urban areas but the burning of biomass or the matter which is extracted from the biological substances like the crop residues is also adding much amount of the nitrogen oxides into the atmosphere that has been responsible so traditionally what are the sources of nitrogen oxides what are the impacts of nitrogen oxides these could be the basic questions that can come out of uh, this the factual question that can come out of this is where this assessment or who has started this assessment assessment started by the greenpeace and what could be the impact of the nitrogen oxides or oxides of nitrogen it can be these three impacts and then nitrous oxide is a direct candidate of being a greenhouse gas also right so all these are the major things which are associated with this particular issue then the black carbon has also been into news black carbon if we look up to then a grade of pollutant which is also created because of incomplete combustion of fossils and it is a solidified residue of smoke which is purified form of carbon or is also produced as soot right by burning of fossils biomass etc this black carbon is one of the major candidate which is enforcing greenhouse uh, which is forcing global warming and it is a non greenhouse global warming contributor
non greenhouse global warming contributor there are two types of the global warming contributor one is the greenhouse type of gases the greenhouse type of gases which include carbon dioxide methane then chlorofluorocarbons perfluorocarbons etc then we have sulfur hexafluorides nitrous oxides uh, uh, sulfur trifluorides uh, rather nitrogen trifluorides these are major gases which are the greenhouse type of gases which induces warming of the lower atmosphere these three black carbon together with this the the younger brother of it the brown carbon and the aerosol or the carbon based aerosols these are three which are taken up as the non greenhouse type of global warming agent and they are enforcing warming through two major uh, method they are enforcing warming through two major methods number one first they are candidates in photochemical smog formation that is black carbon if it is present over there gets oxidized then with nitrogen oxides forms paracyl nitrates or per benzyl nitrates and then is responsible for formation of the black photochemical smog that is one problem the second problem with the black carbon which is produced is uh, with the glaciers because when it comes down or it deposits over the glaciers then it reduces the albedo the amount of sunlight which is reflected back if it reduces the albedo then it triggers glacial ablation this ablation then is responsible for the release of glacial methane which then again is a global warming agent so which then triggers the meltdown of the glaciers or much amount of the glacial ablation is seen also because of this the methane release is seen that's why this black carbon is problematic of the 72% of the total aerosols or the non greenhouse type of aerosols which are present which are enforcing warming are the black carbons that's why they have been responsible report says that amount of black carbons they are increasing from states like punjab and haryana the major factors associated to it would be stubble burning also and the other developmental factors which have been seen or the development initiatives which have been seen in haryana they are adding much amount of the black carbon black carbon if it is created is in such near proximity of the himalayas that is also dangerous the impacts the the long term impact of these black carbon it has been stated that it can be a threat to the himalayan alpine glaciers where the impact of it is already been seen constant right that is one aspect or the second issue which has been discussed the third issue is related to erratic monsoon and the problems related to erratic monsoon in the southeast asian patches itself not only in indian subcontinent but in the complete southeast asian patches if we look up to has been attributed to increasing extent of air pollution right write down a question on this issue. though this is a traditional issue we have discussed the details of it earlier also write down a question and then we look up to the aspects of it recently it has been stated recently it has been stated that the erratic cycles of monsoon in india can be attributed to increasing air pollution can be attributed to increasing air pollution how number 1 increasing number of aerosols 
increasing number of aerosols increase the cloud condensation nuclei and atmosphere increase the cloud condensation nuclei and atmosphere so the condensation cycle of water is disturbed so the condensation cycle of water is disturbed number 2 number of aerosols in atmosphere increase the aerosol optical depth increase the aerosol optical depth which then influences the transmission of sunlight in any area which disturbs the heat quotient in any area which disturbs the heat quotient in any area third aerosols are also responsible for ablation of fresh water bodies like glaciers for ablation of fresh water bodies like glaciers which is increasing the relative amount of water in rivers which is increasing the relative amount of water in rivers number 4 long range variability of aerosols long range variability of aerosols have created widespread have created widespread brown clouds have created widespread brown clouds in south east asian regions in south e south east asian regions which then disturbs the weather phenomena of these regions which then disturbs the weather phenomena of these regions which of the above is correct only one and two only one and four only 1 2 and 4 all of the above so there is a slight confusion with third point i guess but first to theek hai there is a problem it increases the cloud condensation nucleus so the amount of erratic formation of the clouds in any particular area increases the second thing says that 
the optical density decreases so the amount of light which is transmitted downward and upward is also is also restricted which increases the gross heating in any particular area so the cloudy days they are more uh, warmer comparatively or they are more humid that is one factor which has been seen if the amount of aerosols they would increase the darker cloud would also increase if the darker cloud would increase the warmer days in any particular area would also increase this will create an erratic patch of heat or movement of the air across the continent the third thing if the aerosol increases then the glaciers increases now if the glaciers uh, rather the de glaciers decreases if the glaciers decrease then the water relative water in the rivers increase then that water is gone in the oceans then sea level increases sea level increases how does it impacts the monsoon in any particular area changes the water currents if the amount of oceanic water would increase then the ocean currents would change thermo energy of ha huh, thermo aligned circulation can affect can be affected apart from this the evaporative cycles can also be affected the evaporative and condensation cycles can be affected if if the amount of uh, riverine water increases or the gross amount of water which is available for evaporation if it increases obviously the evaporation cycles would also increase if evaporation cycle increases it disturbs the hydrological cycle completely and disturbance of hydrological cycle would then also lead towards erratic rainfall in any particular area right the fourth one can also be correct the same thing the bro, uh, the brown clouds or the photochemical smogs they have created erratic heat patches the, these erratic heat patches can also be problematic and the maintenance of the monsoon or the climatic variability so there could be a confusion on the third one right there could be a doubt on the third option which is created that increases the water content in rivers that may disturb the uh, the evaporative and condensation cycle also if the relative increase in rivers also disturbs that particular cycle also right decrease and increase both will have an impact on evaporative and condensation cycles so if we look up to this question 1 2 3 and 4 all of them can be the correct options then the issue number 4 in the pollution that can be spoken of the fourth issue speaks about pet coke or the petroleum coke two things into this what exactly is pet coke pet coke is a solidified residue of fractional distillation of petroleum the fractional distribution of petroleum or the crude oil lead towards many things which are formed at the uppermost we will find the spirit or the petroleum spirit then we have the gasohol or rather the gasoline or the petrol then we have uh, the lighter oils which can be uh, the turbine fuels also then we can have uh, the kerosene diesel then we have the bitumen which is also taken up we have the jellies which are been created between this range between this post diesel the the tar then the jelly we also extract certain solidified substances which is pet coke pet coke is created when we reduce the volatile substances of petroleum oil volatiles are reduced of the tar oil based substances the tar oil which is which, which can also be residue which then becomes the bitumen also right pet coke can be one of the important or has been one of the important fuel which is burnt along with the coal which was used in fire stations also for was also used for boiler assemblies for heating purposes all of it but the major problem associated with pet coke if we compare pet coke versus coal right now then the amount of carbon dioxide produced comparatively is nearly 8 to 10% higher in 
per kg equivalent or the per gram equivalents of the coal. That's why it is more dangerous than coal currently. So a ban is now being imposed that pet coke burning must be reduced or must be must be uh, must not be practiced currently so that the amount of gross amount of uh, carbon dioxide which is produced because of this it can be reduced right question how it is formed why it is used and why it is banned three things how formed fractional distillation why it is or why it is used it is used as a fire adjuvant also or the fire uh, substance adjuvant also why it is banned it is banned because much amount of the carbon dioxide is produced or comparative amount of the carbon dioxide is higher with the pet coke right then the euro 6 compliance has be has to be rolled up or bs6 is to be rolled up bs6 we have discussed enough amount of it or this thing but quickly in uh, in the year 2000 bharat 2000 was started then we had the marshallgar committee coming up the marshallgar committee has initiated the emission norms in delhi ncr we has we had bharat stage 1 in 2001 and then rest of the country bharat stage 1 was rolled upon in 2004 and then later on by 2010 we had bharat stage 4 in delhi ncr and bharat stage 3 in rest of the country and then bharat stage five to be rolled upon in, in 2015 which didn't came in 2016 rest of the country brought down to Bharat stage four and now in two, 2018 Bharat stage six in Delhi NCR and by 2020 Bharat stage six in rest of the country is to be brought down if Bharat stage six is being brought down the the amount of sulfur dioxide that can be reduced to 10 parts per million which is gross reduction in the amount of sulfur dioxides the particulate matter can also be reduced and there could be a gross reduction of particulate matter by 50 to 70 percent ejections specifically in the light petrol waste vehicles also with the diesel waste vehicle the reduction in particulate matter can be seen reduction in volatile organic substances or volatile organic compounds can also be seen also reduction in nitrogen oxide and their mix with the sulfur dioxide that can also be seen so Bharat stage is an emission standard which is imposed over the vehicles looks up for four major part uh, four major types of the part pollutants sulfur dioxide nitrogen dioxide mix volatile organic substances particulate matters and the amount of carbon based substances which are produced out of the emissions of the automobiles right so these are initiatives under Bharat state system the sixth one the air quality early warning system an early warning system is being created by the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology IITM Pune and the meteorological department and the national center for medium range weather forecasting that is in Noida these three have created an early warning system this early warning system would be able to predict the weather of any particular area three to four days in advance that's why it is important apart from this early warning system is weather condition relative to the pollutants it can expect what amount of the pollutants would be created in any particular area would then will help in quantifying eight different pollutants so the fact that can be important in that all eight important air pollutants like particulate matter 2.5 10 nitrogen oxide carbon monoxide sulfur dioxide black carbon uh, the volatile organic substances and the organic substances OCs are the organic substances or the organic compounds and volatile organic compounds they can be monitored constantly with this early warning system it will help to predict that any particular area if the amount of pollutants are to be increased or it, if they will increase relative to the local factors relative to the surrounding factors relative to the weather factors also all of these if they are being uh, taken then it would be able to predict that the amount of pollutants can increase so the local governments will have enough amount of the time to manage these pollutants or to or to uh, or to raise health hazards which can be imposed right so apart from this warnings are also been imposed by NACI that is national air quality index NACI which also goes for eight different types of the pollutants which are been which are seen in any particular area apart from the pollutants which are listed NACI goes for uh, the particulate matter 2.1 uh, 2.5 particulate matter 10 ammonia 
is also taken, lead is also taken, ozone is also taken, nitrogen oxides, volatile organic substances, these are major pollutants which are taken up by NACI. The National Air Quality Index, which is real-time monitoring of the pollutants currently, which is present with Delhi NCR with, uh, and 13 cities was NACI. Then now the extent of NACI is to be extended up to 36 cities, later to be extended up to 58 cities also. It increases the? Reduces insulation. First thing, tell, tell me what is insulation? The incoming solar radiation, right? Now tell me one simple thing. If you wear a white pant one day and a black pant next day, more heat is felt on, more heat is felt in, Obviously, so we have more amount of the black carbon surrounding the surface, more amount of the heat is absorbed. So insulation would not reduce, rather it would increase. First aspect is a pollutant, obviously we have discussed that thing. Black carbon is something which is taken up as the non-greenhouse agent for global warming also. So obviously is a pollutant. Right. So NACI will help in real time assessment of these pollutants and would also be useful for uh, uh, predicting the amount of pollutants which are increasing, but it is a real time thing. It, it raises public concerns and health hazards also with several categories or six categories of the uh, air, uh, air quality has been created. So uh, under these six categories, the pollution standards can be created for different different areas and concerns can be raised, but it is not beforehand. The beforehand initiatives can be taken up with the air quality early warning system AQE WS which is initiated by IITM and the National Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Ye do centers kisi aur cheez ke liye bhi abhi news mein the. Haan, they, were, they were also in uh, news for two super computers that is Pratyush and Meher super computers right. Then we had uh, the government of India has also created the dust mitigation plan. Specifically, this dust mitigation plan has been, uh, has been created uh, currently to reduce the, amount, the prevalence of dust, to reduce the amount of particulate matter in the urban air area. Uh, specifically, we look up to, it has been predicted that 52% of this, the particulates which, which are seen in the urban area, they are because of the dust which is prevalent. And dust comes from the surrounding areas because of a dust dome which is created because of increasing heat in the urban areas, number one. Second, dust also comes up from the open soil which is present in the urban area. Dust also comes from construction and demolition sites. Dust also comes from the coal based power stations which have fly ash which has been, uh, which is there in, the, in those areas. Dust also comes from the construction and demolition site because these sites are open and their surfaces are also open, right. Dust also is created in the busy or the uh, uh, congested traffic areas also. Congested traffic circles also have much amount of the dust and constantly changing uh, uh, weather based uh, variabilities in the urban area also brings up much amount of the dust. So all this increases the amount of particulate matter which is present which is majorly because of 52% of it is majorly because of the dust which is present. To control this under the national clean air program also the initiatives are being taken up which is the national dust mitigation strategy. The national dust mitigation strategy or the dust mitigation strategy speaks about four major things. Number one, if there is an open area, you cover that particular open area. Second, you hydrate that open area so that the dust can be settled down or third, if there is a construction or demolition site and there are open roads or open pavements across which there is a transport, right? Trucks come and trucks go and much amount of the dust is produced in that particular area. You cover that particular area either with, even with a bitumen or a black surface or with the concrete so that dust is not produced in these construction and demolition area, right? There must be fountains of water which can be placed in the busy uh, traffic areas so that amount of dust which is produced in these busy areas, it can be hydrated or the particulates can be hydrated and they can be settled also. Right, that would also be one of the strategy. Then covering up of the open areas under the municipal corporation uh, authorities. Under the municipal corporation authorities or 
the municipal areas if we have much amount of the uh, dust or the open areas side by side the roads they can be covered or they can or they uh, we, we must have covering initiators or the grass initiatives which can be taken up so that dust can be reduced from the road sides also then the vacuum cleaning up of the dust in the roads was all, is also taken up as a dust mitigation strategy right vacuum cleaning up of the roads will help to reduce the amount of dust which is coming up with the transport or which has been sprinkled here and there because of the transport apart from this fly ash mitigation strategies have also been taken up fly ash utilization plan and then the thermo power stations they have been inducted with an initiative with a, with a particular uh, uh, directive that the amount of fly ash which has been produced must be kept at below 30 percent of the fly ash which has been produced or stored apart from this utilization must be initiated apart from this an app is also created by ministry of uh, power to locate where fly ash is available so that its utility can be reduced if fly ash is present with any power plant it must be kept under uh, under closed uh, areas or must be properly covered or hydrated so that it must not come directly into the atmospheric turbulence all of these they have been taken up under the national clean air program to reduce the dust or that becomes the dust mitigation strategy under national clean air program things one it has came up under the national clean air program which is an important umbrella initiative which has been taken up second thing that can come up is mitigation strategy has to be holistic it would it would be for large scale utilities in the urban areas and specifically this plan is right now taken up for delhi ncr right that has been into news then the eighth thing that comes up is the biojet fuel flight the biojet fuel flight has been taken up by spicejet and they have mixed 25 percent of the uh, biodiesel extracted from jetrofa with the air uh, aircraft turbine fuel and one of the engine and next engine was running with 100 percent atg so 25 percent plus uh, 75 percent air traff, uh, aircraft turbine grade fuels this is extracted as biodiesel right and the flight has run through uh, Delhi, between Dehradun to Delhi and it was also under the initiatives taken up by the Indian Institute of Petroleum Technology Dehradun right is done by Spicejet these are factual things the basic things biodiesel biodiesel is the vegetative oil which can be fractioned and utilized for energy develop energy generation purposes in internal combustible engines the engines which can internally burn or which burns fuel or oil in restrictive uh, conditions biodiesel can be produced by plants like jetrofa or ratanjot plants like ponjemia pinnata or karanj in the forest of the dry deciduous biodiesel is also produced by or can be produced by rapeseed and canola though not in india but is popular in other countries biodiesel can also be produced by algae currently the biodiesel produced by jetropa is taken up as generation one of the biofuel under the national biofuels policy of 2018 and the algae based biodiesel is taken up as the generation 3 of the biofuel under the national biofuel policy 2018 so biodiesel production is experimentally seen currently jetropa ponjemia or karanj rapseed canola can be the plants major ones which have been inducted right now is jetropa only we also had the national Jetropa program or Rashtri Ratanjot Karikram started from 2001 which was also taken up but the market strategy for this production of it sale of it is now being created under the national biofuel policy apart from this using biodiesel we have also experimentally run different other vehicles also uh, vehicles like the rail engine was was also tested over biodiesel 
the lighter uh, motors are also tested over biodiesel generators are also tested trucks and buses are also tested over biodiesel right experimentally tested so all these are certain initiatives at the global standard we can go up to 50% of biodiesel and 50% of the air uh, aircraft turbine grade fuel also right but right now for uh, for indian purpose it is 25% of it is being tested right as a mix so if even if this mix comes up 25% of it is being mixed is mixed we would be able to cut down the cost of the fuel by 5 to 15% and a gross emission by 5 to 9% so if this becomes a futuristic strategy this can be utilizable but yes test flights have to be taken how it performs in what type of the temperature condition or at what uh, pressure conditions up how this particular oil performs that is one aspect that has to be taken up with biodiesel production right so that became a bio oil based jet fuel that was also into news next we have the satat initiative that is also one factual aspect the satat initiative which is uh, which is sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation is an initiative which has been taken up to bring up biogas or bio cng based initiatives right under this the utility of biogas as an alternative where it can be compressed and filled with the cylinders and if it can be used in transport such initiatives are to be taken up under satat sustainable alternative for transportation under this the biogas if we look up to biogas is a mix of methane and carbon dioxide plus hydrogen where methane and carbon dioxide act as the combustible component of this particular gas this gas is produced by an aerobic decomposition of the organic waste material organic waste like the waste from the from the agriculture the urban uh, the domestic waste the urban uh, waste urban domestic waste all of it they can be taken up majorly biogas production initiatives have been taken up recently as gobardhan initiative of government of india for rural area apart from this in the urban area also initiatives have been taken up as policy to promote city compost which would also be responsible for generation of methane or biogas type of ga uh, biogas type of substances now this gobardhan that is galvanizing the organic biofuel through agro based resources that is gobardhan right so gobar is for that is an initiative taken up for production of this biogas if this biogas can be extracted and filled in cylinders it can be a long term initiative which can be taken up for cleaner transport in the urban areas that has been into news and this will also trigger the biogas plantations in the rural india which which has which had lost its uh, way in the mid because it was only used for rural uh, rural india or for the domestic purposes of the rural part of the country see basic utility was lesser and the amount of effort which was to be put in into this was much higher and the space based constraints the uh, other uh, uh, problems associated to the uh, the biogas generation or the overall output of it was not commercial so many people were not very uh, motivated towards production of the biogas now if such initiatives can be created 
market value additions can be uh, can be seen for biogas if market value additions can be seen for biogas obviously long term variabilities can be seen or long term initiatives like govardhan or policy for city compost they will they will produce fruitful results also and a cleaner fuel can be available in the urban transport for that this stat initiative has been taken up or for compressed biogas cbg introduction of this is this initiative right so the name what is the initiative and then what exactly is biogas what is the combustible component methane and carbon dioxide how it is produced that is the issue of concern next thing that we can look up to or practically the last issue for today right is vayu an initiative which has been taken up by the union ministry of science and technology under this under one of the major research institute that is niri national institute for uh, national environmental engineering and research institute niri nagpur has created one of the uh, component which is air cleaning component this air cleaning component has three major parts number one it sucks in the part uh, sucks in the air the particulates and the aromatic substances or the volatile pollutants they can be reduced and then it pumps in the air in any particular area so taking air filtering particulates and the volatiles and then giving it back into that area is the initiative which is under is the basic utility of this machine vayu right now to filter out the particulates it has specially designed filters or the membrane based filters also apart from this it has uv lamp this uv lamp helps to burn down the aromatic or the volatile substances which are there in the air pollution or as an air pollutant and when it compresses fresh air back it helps to dilute the amount of particulates which are present or the pollutants which are present in any particular area so it can capture filter and dilute the pollutants in any particular area will help to cut down the amount of pollution of the urban airs that's why it can be a futuristic tool that can be used currently vayu is vayu is designed for a smaller area where uh, vayu can be useful for uh, a, a diameter of 100 uh, or 1000 uh, meter uh, square larger vayu instruments are to be developed which could be functional for 10000 uh, square meters also up to 10 kilometers they can be operatable they would be larger vayu or mega vayu instruments are to be developed right so the instrument which can capture air or it can be a cyclone separator for the particulates capture filter and push in the fresh air is the initiative taken up by niri national environment engineering research institute of csir which is under ministry of science and technology chalo next things tomorrow uh, we'll discuss rest of the things tomorrow we'll try to discuss more things in a faster way because today biodiversity is something which is more interrelatable and we wanted a better discussion for biodiversity right so we'll continue tomorrow thank you